Good evening, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome Kevin Kwan um, for his latest novel, Sex and Vanity. Kevin, thank you so much for being here from LA. I Great to be here. here. Great. Uh, virtually. I also to, virtually, yes, to be in this space together. Um, I also want to welcome Leslie Bo, uh, who is a professor here at the University of Wisconsin um, and will be our moderator tonight. Leslie, welcome back to the festival. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as always, I want to welcome or thank the Madison Public Library Foundation, Madison Public Library and all of our sponsors. They have been absolutely steadfast in making sure that these events have kept going throughout the pandemic. Um, free cultural events have rarely meant more and it has been my pleasure to bring you um, all of them for the last 15 months. Uh, I was just saying before we got on that this is our 27th event of the spring. It is also our final event of the spring. So um, we have one event in the summer with Dr. Michelle Harper for her memoir, The Beauty and Breaking. But other than that, um, you won't see much of us until September. Um, and we were just told that we should start planning for in-person events in September. So I'm very delighted to be able to say, maybe we'll be able to do that <laughs> at some point um, in the next couple of months. I also wanna mention, um, that we are giving away free copies of Sex and Vanity tonight. Um, once the conversation gets going, I will put a link below the video. All you have to do is click the green button and our bookselling partners at A Room One's Own will send you a free copy courtesy of the Wisconsin Book Festival um, so that you have all of your summer reading taken care of. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to welcome back Leslie Bo. Leslie is a professor of English and Asian American Studies here at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she is the author of Partly Colored, which investigates the Asian American racial experience in the Jim Crow South. She is a contributor to the Progressive Magazine and on the editorial board of Contemporary Women Writers. And her current work explores the relationship between race and desire and portrayals of cultural difference. Leslie, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank, thank you, Connor. Um, um, thanks for having us. Anytime. And Kevin, I want to welcome you. Um, thank you so much for this book. It, is, it was such a pleasure to read. Um, it really takes us on a worldwide tour and makes us think about all the places that we'd like to go in this I Can't Travel time. Um, we follow, follow Lucy Tang Churchill as she finds herself torn between two men, and two cultures, and um, does it while visiting both the upper echelon of Capri and the upper echelon of New York City. Um, I, I hesitate to even introduce Kevin because I feel like everyone here knows who he is, but you deserve an introduction. So I will say Kevin is the author of the international bestsellers Crazy Rich Asians, China Rich Girlfriend and Rich People Problems. Crazy Rich Asians was a number one New York Times bestseller, a major motion picture and has been translated into more than 30 languages. And in 2018, Kevin was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. We are so lucky to have him spend an hour with us tonight. I will step away and leave the conversation to you. Thank you so much, and I'll see you at the end. Thanks, Connor. Um, thanks go to Connor and the Wisconsin Book Festival and also the Asian American Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we're so pleased to have uh, Kevin with us. I'm not gonna add that much more to that introduction because I think people are here because they're really excited about uh, the author, seeing the author of Crazy Rich Asians, and I suspect they've also uh, seen the major, major motion picture, you know, as well. And I just want to rift off of that 100 most influential people in the world. Now, when I read Sex and Vanity, I think, hmm, I have an idea maybe as to why that appellation, you know, has been granted, you know, to Kevin, because I think there are big changes going on in the world today, and that Kevin, you really uh, tapped some zeitgeist, um, and these are re these ideas are reflected in Sex and Vanity, um, particularly uh, about race in a shifting global economy, and that's actually a very exciting topic to me. So welcome, you know, uh, Kevin, to virtual Wisconsin, and I understand that you're going to do a bit of a reading for us. So do you want to set it up for us a bit? First? Sure. Yeah. First of all, thank you all for being here tonight. It's so fun to be here virtually. I wish I could be there in person in Madison, but one of these days, right? Um, also want to make sure we do have people, have people have been let in, right? Because I'm seeing on my participant screen only three people. Just want to make sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. Oh, well, I can shoot a text to um, comment. Perfect. Okay, no worries. 
or three is fine too, but I just wanted to make sure because I've, yeah, I've, I've had many um, tumultuous adventures on Zoom over the past year. <laughs> I've done like live recordings that didn't record. <laughs> yes, I'm just making sure the technology works for everyone. So, so I'm going to read from um, Sex and Vanity, my new novel out in paperback now. And I'm going to read a chapter um, that is towards the beginning of the book when you're first getting to meet and get to know the heroine of the book, Lucy Tang Churchill. And she has just been taken exploring the town of Capri. She just went shopping and now she's just having, you know, really her first minute alone um, on the island. About 50 Japanese came marching along, trying valiantly to maintain an orderly line behind their tour group leader, who was holding up a yellow stick with a rubber duck on the end of it. Lucy was jostled along with the crowd for a few minutes before she darted quickly into the vestibule of a vintage jewelry shop for a moment's respite. She was a little annoyed that Olivia had abandoned her and wondered if she would be able to find her way to the hotel along the back lanes again. The crowd thinned out for a moment and Lucy managed to make it to the Piazzetta without incident, where she found the last available table at the Grand Cafe. She sat down gratefully, placing her shopping bag on the wicker seat next to her and pouring over the leather-bound menu. A silver-haired waiter in a dapper white blazer approached the table and said with a bow, Konnichiwa. Lucy stared at him in confusion for a few moments before realizing that he was greeting her in Japanese. Uh, ni hao ma? He tried again. I'm sorry, I don't speak Chinese, she said, turning up the volume on her American accent. Ah, Americano! Easy peasy, let me guess, you want dyed coke with ice. Lucy forced a smile. Actually, I think I'll try the granita al limone. Lemon granita, perfect for this hot day, the waiter said jovially. The sun was just cresting over the mountaintop directly in Lucy's sight line, so she put on her sunglasses. In her short white Erdem dress with the cute Bresson lace sleeves and her dark glasses on, she somehow felt very European and grown up at the moment. This is what she loved doing the most when she traveled to Europe, sitting at an outdoor cafe, watching the world go by. Whenever they visited Paris, she always insisted on dragging her mother and Freddie to an outdoor table at La Palate her favorite cafe in Saint-Germain, and she wished that it could, it could be here right now with her. Lucy glanced covertly at the people seated around her. She loved checking people out and making up stories in her mind about them. On her left was a young, attractive Italian couple looking longingly into each other's eyes. On their honeymoon, possibly? To her right were two smartly dressed men, an American guy with dark blonde hair and a blue striped t-shirt and navy blazer talking to an Asian guy with a goatee wearing a pair of round 1930s retro style sunglasses. They looked like they worked in fashion and were here on business. She overheard the Asian guy saying, I need to remember to get sandals made for Alexandra and Jackie. And she wondered if it was because he noticed her shopping bag from Da Costanzo. Behind her were two middle-aged women smoking and having an intense discussion in German while a humongous Great Dane sat quietly at, her, at their heels. Were they sisters, rehashing an old family feud? Within a few minutes, the waiter returned and placed a large glass bowl on her table, containing a mountain of slushy lemon granita, accompanied by a single thin slice of cantaloupe wedged on the rim of the glass. Lucy smiled in delight at the dessert before her. It reminded her of the desserts she loved getting at serendipity when she was a kid although this presentation looked decidedly more elegant. She sat at the table, sipping the granita contentedly from the straw. It was deliciously icy, and the freshly squeezed lemon juice was so refreshingly tart as it went down her throat. She was wondering if she should take a nibble of the cantaloupe now, or save it for later, after she finished granita, when out of the corner of her eye, she saw a tall elderly white man enter the piazza, wobble slightly, and then stumble against the table where the Italian couple were seated. The Italian man sprang up from his chair and helped the man to his feet. 
the old man stood for a split second, took a step forward, and then went crashing down again, his head landing right onto Lucy's dessert, breaking the glass bowl and splashing lemon granita all over her. Lucy found herself glued to her chair, unable to move. It seemed as if time had stopped. No one did a thing. The Italian couple stared helplessly at the old man. The Germans just sat there, and the waiters stood like statues. All around them were dozens of glamorous-looking people, frozen at their tables and gawking. She heard the American beside her say, I think he's dying. And then somewhere behind her, a lady with a British accent cried, We simply must! The man's eyes rolled back. She heard a rattle deep in his throat and his face turned blue. But all she could see was red, the red blood vessels in the whites of his eyes, the red gushing from his head onto the white tablecloth. She finally stood up and then she fell to the ground. She felt the ground beneath her spin and everything went black. Lucy had no idea how long she had been unconscious. Maybe it was just seconds, but when she came to, she felt something warm and soft cradling her neck. She looked up and saw George Zhao looking down at her and realized that his hands were cushioning her head. You okay? He asked. She nodded, and then she turned and saw a waiter hovering over the old man, who was now lying on the ground in front of her. The waiter was pounding on the man's chest repeatedly as the Great Dane started whimpering. Just stay there. Don't try to get up, George said jumping up and heading towards the man on the ground. Stop hitting him like that, he pushed the waiter aside. Someone call a doctor, he shouted, as he bent down, lifted the man's chin, and gave him two quick rescue breaths. Lucy got up from the ground slowly and began backing away from the scene. George was now frantically pumping the man's chest and yelling, fucking call a doctor! Something within her told her that she couldn't look anymore. She couldn't stand there and watch this man die. She turned around and started walking away. The minute she rounded the corner, out of the sight of the piazzetta, she started to run. Thanks so much, Kevin. I'm back. I'm going to put us in a in a gallery view. Thank you for that for that reading. I have to ask you the the academic geek question, which is you know, interestingly, based on exactly that passage that you had read, but that is a passage that also happens in Ian Forrester's Room with a View. And of course, you said that Sex and Vanity is partly based on Ian Forrester, and you get the same, like, similar names of, of characters and similar plot structure. Why was Room with a View important for you in Sex and Vanity? What was the what was the parallelism that you wanted to get at? You know, it just was for me kind of a seminal work. Um, I remember reading it when I was in high school. I think I was probably about fifteen years old, and it really spoke to me. Um, I felt that E.M. Forster had written a book that was quite ahead of its time. You know, in in the way to examine the internal life of of this girl who was really just, you know, coming of age. It's really a coming of age story in a way. And also the book was so seductive in every way. You know, there's a love story between, you know, his Lucy and George, but there's also a love story to Italy. Mm -hmm. And there's a love story to England and to, to family and to, you know, this moment in time that he's so beautifully captured. So I really, really, really responded to that. It's one of my favorite books of all time. So when I thought about what I wanted to write next after the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy, I just thought it would be a fun challenge to to write a book that was, you know, it's, it's not so much based on Forster's book, but more an homage, you know, mm -hmm. it tips the hat um, because it does, you know, there's, a similar setup in the beginning, but then my book veers into a very different direction than his. Um, but I, I wanted to see how I could take this book that I love so much and reinvent it um, and really tell the story I wanted to tell, you know, with, with all the layers that I wanted to put into it. And, and I love the way that this book riffs on 
crazy rich Asians in that same kind of, I, I wanted to say like a, a culture clash or a world clash, but not in the sense of like geographic, you know, worlds clashing, Hong Kong and Singapore, London, New York. Mm -hmm. It was more um, not geographically defined, but more about different worlds colliding. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more of that, because that's certainly part of the Forrester work as well, right? You have de these different pockets of upper class culture. And that reminded me a lot of in this book, too, of Crazy Rich Asians. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. There's a kind of like new money, old money clash going on. Yeah, I mean, that's a very astute observation. It's, you know, with Forster, he really also was looking at the clash of clash of, of classes in England, you know, the, the lower classes, the middle classes and the upper classes and, and how, how they all intersected. And beyond that, the clash of time, you know, he was he wrote a remove of you at this moment, it was the beginning of the of the Edwardian age. Mm -hmm. But Lucy is very much really kind of trapped she's a victim of the victorian age you know um for me i was interested in in looking at this you know the new global landscape right because yeah. not only do we have the new money and the old money but we have this international 0.1 percent money you know that that transcends geography because they all have private planes and they drift from major city to major city, they don't really have, they have many residences, you know, Rosemary Zhao has, I think, what, four or five houses around the world. Um, so it's this sort of global elite, many of whom are Asian. But beyond that, you know, when we're looking at the worlds clashing in Lucy's own world, two worlds clash within her, you know, she she's a biracial Asian American, and has to reconcile the Chinese side of her with the New York Yankee side of her, you know, and, and I, I wanted to pick up on that in a minute, but I wanted to go back to the word that you used, which was homage, right? When you're talking about Forrester. And, you know, when I was reading Crazy Rich Asians, the first, you know, iteration mm -hmm. of this engagement with that global 1%, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, a lot about, um, well, is Kevin Kwan an insider, you know, to that milieu or is he an outsider? And there's a lot of, uh, when I was reading Sex and Vanity, thinking a little bit about, well, you know, there's a kind of a satire, right, which punches up of that global elite, the 1%, but it's not um, mean, right? It's, it's kind of loving in a way, and that riffs off that idea of an homage. And I'm wondering about that tension here, and I was thinking, oh, is there, are you part of that culture or outside of that culture? Are you a witness to it? What's your insider outsider lens to the worlds that you're depicting? I really feel, you know, first of all, I'm not part of the 1% global elite, um, not by any long shot. I'm an outsider who is, for some strange reason, I've been given a visa to, to, to have an insider's peak. Um, every now and then, you know, it's it's a visa that gets me in sometimes, sometimes expires, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's, I'm able to peek into these worlds occasionally, put it this way, but I'm certainly not a part of them. And it's certainly not a daily life thing by any means, you know. But, but as Gen Z would say, that 1% is really extra. And I, I'm wondering yeah. if there is something that you have depicted in your works or that you have self yourself have seen that is just over the top to you in that environment. Well, I mean, there's so much that I've seen and so much of it makes its way into my books, you know, um, especially with the new one, you know, um, there's a lot of design and architecture porn, for example, <laughs> um, in, in this book. Um, because it's it's what I'm you know I I lived in New York for for two decades over two decades, and I saw really close up the transformation of a city, you know starting from the 90s to now that has really transformed itself from, you know a center of culture, and a great American city to really an international city for the rich. And mm. I don't say that in a complimentary way. Mm. Um, I, I I feel that so much has been lost because of that. 
Um, and the same can be said for London, you know, where there is this super class of people who are just so, so exponentially more privileged than the rest of us, um, that they float above the top, that they can come to the city and really desecrate a beautiful skyline with these hideous, you know, skyscrapers that they build that no one lives in. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's they're just literally $35 million bank deposit boxes, you know, of real estate. And what's fascinating to me is that there are so many cultural references here that are both high end in that sense, you know, high culture, you know, aware of those global changes, but also like, you know, popular cultural references. And I, and I love that notion of density, right? That one of the things that I note about um, this work is the d density of detail, right? All the references, all the descriptions. And it's so funny, I felt like very, you know, being a woman of a certain age, I was looking at some of these uh, citations, everything from the designers to Jamie Dornan to Dynasty to Wong Kar uh, Wai and Yoya Kusama. And I'm just like, wow, th that's an incredible array of references that you have in your works. Is that stylistically something that you were going for that you're self-conscious about as you're writing? Or is it something that you're envisioning for an ideal reader? No, it's, it's everything I do is, is purposeful, you know? Um, and it, it sort of began when I wrote the Crazy Witch trilogy. It began with the first book where I felt that to really depict the culture of this group of people accurately, I had to really tell it like it was, you know? And for these people, many of these people, you know, I don't want to generalize, but so many of these people in this echelon are defined by labels, by their, by literally what they're wearing, by, you know, by their designer labels, mm -hmm. um, by the watch they wear, by, by the handbag they carry, by the shoes, you know, everything is a signifier to them that lets them know, are you in the club or not? Yeah. You know? yeah. And this announces me as someone that's in the club, that's worthy of getting that best table in the restaurant or worthy of the upgrade at the airline, you know, or whatever it is, you know, it, it, it's these accoutrements are so important to them and they speak about it so openly and loosely in their conversation. You know, they're name dropping, brand dropping a mile a minute. And so I originally use that as satire, you know, where I just was mm -hmm. quoting that sort of designer diarrhea that came out of the mouths of people I had heard because it, to me, it's so amusing, right? I, I would never do, I would never in my life name drop a label, you know, that to me, I consider vulgar, right? But for these people, this is just how they live. And there's not, there's no judgment to them for that. And, um, and, there's, yeah. and I love the way that you multiply those sites of those status mm -hmm. signifiers. And of course, there's, you know, the reference of the addresses and the educational status. You have this send up of the seating chart, which is just this really wonderful seating chart at a wedding. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned Instagram. And I'm a, I'm a little curious just to ask whether or not you think that Instagram and or how Instagram fits in, right? And social media fits in to those signifiers. Like, so there's designers. There's yeah, I mean. Pedigree. That's a really interesting observation because the rich used to be very invisible or they really hid themselves, you know? And I think there's a generation of kids who grew up in well-to-do families where they were taught from a young age. It's like, you know what? You don't display your money. You don't talk about your money. Um, you really want to be covert about it. Um, and now that's no longer true of the new generation. You know, it's no longer true of Lucy's generation, for example. Um, kids, even from very distinguished, privileged, even sometimes royal families, they're all over Instagram. You know, they are documenting every moment of their lives, um, sometimes completely in an oblivious tone deaf way. Um, and you see that with my character, Cecil, you know, um, he comes from extreme privilege, but he needs that validation of putting on an Instagram and showing it off, you mm -hmm. know, which, and that would have been anathema to, to a previous generation. But for this new generation, life has to be lived 
you know, all the time, 24 seven on social media. And I find that interesting. There has been shift, this shift where the, 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 the rich, many of the rich have come out of, you know, of hiding and are just flaunting it, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, in a way that I've never witnessed before. You and it's know. not just new money, you know, yeah. it'd be yeah, different yeah. if it was just new money, but it's, it's not, it's a lot of old money, a lot of even Royal money, you know, can we shift to talk about uh, race and how it functions in, in, in sex and vanity? Because you've deliberately marked Lucy as Hoppe. And I'm wondering what, what were the added bonuses of situating her as both Chinese and Caucasian? What's the added bonus for, for you as an author for what you could do with that character, Lucy? I mean, to me, it's it's it it's what makes her so intriguing, right? Because she's the embodiment of two cultures, of East meets West, and she, and that to me is a beautiful thing. But for her, that's the source of her existential turmoil. You know, she doesn't know which way to pivot, right? She doesn't she at first really sublimates the Asian side of herself, you know, and, and really veers towards her father's family, you know, who are, who are Caucasian. And then there is also her mother participating in this, the mother sublimating her identity, you know, to allow Lucy to fit in better with her waspy New York Upper East Side relatives. So I just, I found that to be an interesting character to look at um, especially in this day and age when, when so many of us, you know, um, are part of mixed blended families, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we're all becoming much more diverse in that way. And so I really wanted to look at life from her point of view. So you get that definitely that complexity in terms of how she's negotiating, you know, these very status saturated environments as in fact, it's, some people view her as like a trophy, right? For that mm -hmm. sense of exoticism. And I actually love the, the passage that you have about the projection of multiracialism as creating this like uber beautiful species. I think it's Cecil who actually mentions and says, you know, what do you think our children are gonna look like, you know, in the future? Um, and that's just one way that I think it's one of the things that I think is really important about that this work is that, you know, it does this kind of intersectional thing of always interweaving race as some form of status in and above the idea of where you're positioned in, in terms of class, in terms of culture, in terms of that whole educational system. Um, and, I, and I wanted to ask you, because I think that one of the things that's important in the work that you're doing is really putting your finger on this global economic shift and who wears the face of the 1%. Um, do you think that there's gonna be fallout to the notion of Chinese wearing the face of being crazy rich? In other words, this like sticky association between, okay, here's the, here are gonna be the new owners of capital in this new neoliberal age. What is it gonna look like? And is there going to be resentment, racial, racialized resentment against that? Is that something that people have like glommed onto in terms of the writing that you're doing or that comes up when you do a more global tour with your work? Well, you're actually the first person to bring it up <laughs> and to mention <laughs> it, um, to your, really to your credit, I, you know, I have to say. But I, I do, you know, it is something that I, I want to examine and sort of shine a light on, you know, and, and explore in, in my, and I certainly do this with Sex and Vanity, I have to say. Um, but also so much has happened and shifted even in yeah. the eight years since Crazy Rich Agents first came out as a novel, you know, um, that it's ever shifting and evolving, right? And here in America, certainly we have felt the repercussions mm -hmm of the Chinese being spotlit, you know, whether it's they're crazy rich or whether they started a pandemic, you know, right. or whatever it is. And 
So it's, it is very intriguing. It is very disturbing. You know, um, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Um, but it's a, it's a highly complicated and complex issue. Yeah, it, I mean, this whole connection between the virus and anti-Asian bias and uh, violence that's happening in the streets, you know, I wonder if there's a, any way, you know, a pathway between this association, you know, between like, oh, well, who is, you know, crazy rich, you know, getting the, the benefits, right, of this yeah. kind of economic globalization. And, you know, and, and I don't know, I, I hear that you're from Singapore, correct? Or you're, you're that is correct. I, I was born there. Yeah, and and I, I thought it was really intriguing that you said that Singaporeans. There was an interview with you. You said that Singaporeans don't get your didn't get your book, Crazy Rich Asians. And I I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I I don't know if I actually say said that or if that was a quote taken out of context. Um, I I think. Um, a lot of Singaporeans do get my books. I think maybe some family members <laughs> don't get my books, and that was what I was specifically speaking to. They don't. They don't. They don't understand what the big deal is. But I, you know, by and large, I think the book was was um, positively received in in Singapore. And were yeah. you expecting such a global um, uh, embrace with Crazy Rich Agents? Were you prepared for the way in which it had been taken up? So, um, I mean, not at all. I mean, had I known that it would even be a possibility, I would have written it under <laughs> a pseudonym, really. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was, it's everything that's happened has been beyond my wildest imagination. And, and can you talk a little bit about how that has changed your life and your perception of some of the very topics that you're talking about in terms of family dynamics, in terms of, you know, class associations? You know, for me, I guess it's, I've had a very interesting encounter with fame and what fame does and being naturally actually an introvert. It's, it's very weird when you're recognized on the street or in a restaurant or at the airport by TMZ, you know, um, it's a very, it's a strange issue because you don't expect that as an author you would be widely known, you know, there's maybe, yeah, there's maybe like five people in the world who are, who are that famous enough as, as writers, you know, that are recognizable. Um, and I didn't expect that I'd be anywhere close to becoming one of those people. Um, so f it's interesting to see it through the lens of fame and how that has transformed um, a lot of my relationships, you know, um, some for the better, some for the worse. Um, I'm still, I, like I said, I'm, st I'm still figuring it out, you know, because it's like, um, to quote a, a friend of mine, um, the, the author and artist Judy Chicago, um, you know, my life blew up and I'm still trying to put it back together. It, but then you get to meet people like Gemma Chan. <laughs> that's a, that's true, true, yeah. There, there are there are some amazing benefits, and I'm not in any way complaining. You know, I'm I'm observing, and and I'm I'm truly grateful. I am, but it's you know as a as you know you're a writer as well. I'm a writer. You know, like this is we just want to sit in a corner and write. You know, even doing a book event for me is still something I have to get used to. The fact that someone wants to actually listen to me talk um, is still disconcerting in, in in some ways. You know. Yeah. But then the other perk is that you get to do all this research on these really wonderful places like Capri, which I have to say in Sex and Vanity, you know, I, I was just reading Elena Ferrante's um, Neapolitan novels before, and they're actually set in Ischia, which is just mm -hmm. like right across the way from Capri. How did you end up choosing Capri for the uh, setting for Sex and Vanity? Well, it's interesting. Um... Reading Room of a View when I was a teenager mm -hmm. made me fall in love with Italy. So I, I pestered my parents um, to go to Italy to, to, you know, to, to take me on a family vacation with them for a few years and finally succeeded. Um, we finally got to go to Italy. 
And um, while we were on that family trip, we, we went to Capri um, for the first time. And I instantly just was awestruck by the place. It's truly a magical rock in the middle of the Mediterranean. And it has inspired artists, writers, kings and queens for centuries, actually millennia, quite frankly, because, um, you know, the, the emperor Tiberius fell in love with it and fell in love with it so much that he moved the capital of the Roman Empire to Capri back in, I think, 105 AD or sometime around thereabouts. Um, but since then, you know, it's really an island that's attracted writers like Graham Greene, Shirley Hazard. Um, the list is long. Of, so did you get to people. go back to do the research for this novel after you decided to send I, it to I you? did, and it was very subliminal. So, you know, after my first trip, because I loved it so much, I, I, I swore I would go back. Um, and so as an adult, I was able to go back and it's, it's become, you know, a favorite vacation spot that I've been lucky enough to go to, um, you know, return to numerous times. And each time I would visit, I would just, you know, observe. I would, I would really be a fly on the wall in the main piazzetta. You know, it's, it's sitting in the town square, which is called the piazzetta, with this beautiful view and there's one, two, three, four, five cafes all surrounding you and people sitting there. It's, it's like watching an opera come to life, really. And so I would just collect all these stories just from observing people, you know, trip after trip. And many of, of my observation experiences ended up in Sex and Vanity. You know, um, I was sitting having a drink one day um, when a man literally keeled over from a heart attack. Okay, so that was a real Oh, yeah, that incident. was absolutely real incident. And, oh, my God. I thought know, that was, like, based on Room with a View. Well, it, you know, it had a nice intersection with Room with a View, mm -hmm. right? Because in a Room with a View, Lucy witnesses, you know, spoiler alert, but she witnesses a, a man get stabbed in the main piazza in Florence, you know? And so I remember being in Capri when this happened, where this man had a heart attack, and... It was so, it was really kind of traumatic and scarring to witness this happening, you know. Um, it took me a few days to, to recover and to process what I had seen. And then over time, I was like, you know what, this is, <laughs> this is a great plot device, you know. Yeah. And it really dovetails nicely. It's, an, it's a nice sort of conversational moment with Forster's yeah. event in his book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just one example of, of so many things that, you know, I, I'm really, I don't have that much of an imagination as a writer. I'm really an observer and I'm very experiential. So, you know, in all my books, you know, dialogue is overheard. Um, things are observed and, and things come from, you know, either my experiences or experiences of, of people I know. Well, that's all for the better because we're living vicariously a life that we can't live, you know, through you, yeah. which leads me to, you know, to the question. I, I hear this is also going to be part of a trilogy. Is that, is that right? Are we it will be. Yeah. It's a rather unconventional trilogy because the story is complete, you know, with, with, with Lucy's story has mm -hmm. finished. Um, so the next book is going to be new characters. It's a new storyline, but I, I call it my cities trilogy because really, you know, the cities are also a character in my books and in this book, especially, you know, it's, it's kind of my Valentine to New York um, and Capri. And so right. where are, what, glamour, yeah. what glamorous destination are you going to take us to next? In the next book, it will be London. Okay. Um, and then the final book in the trilogy will be Paris. Oh, nice. Yeah. And each book will also pay homage to another great literary work that I love. Ooh, so something else to look forward to. Yeah. And Because I was like look, thinking like, hmm, Shades of Austin, that's my guess. <laughs> Henry James, that's my other guess. It, it, yeah. it, 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 am I close? Am I getting? I mean, you're pretty, pretty hot. So you are pretty did, did close. I, did yeah. I say it? There was a third one. I... <laughs> <laughs> but and that, that, and I have to ask you, just apropos of that emphasis on on race and class, have you been watching Bridgerton? I have actually. Um, Bridgerton 
really was one of the bright spots of the past year for me. Um, just to, to, to me, it was just so refreshing mm -hmm. to see, you know, that classic Victorian tale and, you know, using the device of like a bodice ripper type book mm -hmm. and then to turn it on its head with the casting, with the story, you know, of having a, a black duke and a black queen, you know, um, very, yeah. very cool. Um, yeah. And, and that leads me to this other question about now you're writing novels, but are you also thinking um, more cinematically when you write as a result of the success of the film Crazy Rich Asians? You Does know, influenced you? perhaps in a way, but I think I've always been influenced by cinema um, as much as by by other books, you know, you know, Room of a View, the movie certainly influenced Sex and Vanity as much as the book did in many ways, you know, because the movie is so powerful and it is so timeless, you know. Um, and in my other books, I, I do find that I'm very heavily influenced by some of my favorite directors like Wong Kar Wai, uh, uh -huh. like Bertolucci, yeah. you yeah. know. So it's, it's always, the visual has always mingled with the text as yeah. I write. It, and so my trivial question to you is, if Sex and Vanity becomes a motion picture, any hints about who you'd want to play George and Lucy? Well, that will be really interesting because I think they have to be almost like very young, undiscovered actors. You know, um, Lucy, when we first meet her, is 18, um, as is George. Um, and I can't think of a famous Hapa 18 year old star at this point, right? Um, there They're are some, coming. yeah, there's some upcoming young Chinese actors. So it'll be interesting. It'll be really, really fun to cast. You know, um, there's so much talent out there that just really deserves to be showcased. Um, and that's what I try to do with, with all my projects, you know? Yeah. So Kevin, we're going to move to some questions from the audience. Um, Sounds great. And so I'm just going to read them. So, uh, Ivy Fung asks, is there any character in your book that you relate to in particular? You know, I think there, there are a lot of characters um, in all my books that, that, I, that I personally can relate to. Um, I think that's not unusual for an author. Um, I, I think in this book, let me think, in Sex and Vanity, who do I relate to? <laughs> um, I think in many ways I, I can relate to, to George, you know? Um, I don't have his abs, that's for <laughs> sure, you know? But I, I think he's someone that was born in Hong Kong, but he went to school most of the, most of the time, you know, his formative school years were in Australia um, before he came to, to California for college. So I'm also a product of Asia that's been schooled primarily in the West. Um, so I think a lot of my worldviews would be similar to his. Okay, so we have another question for you. How do you balance including those signifiers of wealth without alienating a reading audience who might not know those illusions? Hmm. Well, you know, you just have to write what you have to write, right? And I, I feel like I never want to condescend to my reader. Um, I, I try to tell a story and sometimes there are things that maybe are illusions or a little more hidden that require one to either have previous knowledge or to want to go deeper. And so, you know, I see a lot of times in comments on social media where readers are like, I had to do so much Googling reading Kevin Kwan's books because looking up artists, for example, or names or brands or, or things that I'd never even heard of in my life, but they all seem to enjoy that experience, right? So I do the same when I read, you know, whenever, you know, unfortunately my English professor from my first year of college kind of, he sort of ruined my reading experience forever because he taught me, he said, you know, have a dictionary by, by you and your reading and look up every word you don't know. And it's a habit for me, you know, and thankfully now I have my phone, <laughs> right? I don't have to have a heavy Webster's with me, but I do do that. I stop myself and anytime I don't know anything, 
I'm looking it up. Um, yeah, yeah. English professors suck. Uh, <laughs> on to the next question. Do people in your life recognize themselves as characters in your books? If so, how has that gone? That's from Rebecca. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. You know, it's actually never happened. Um, there are a few characters here and there in my books that are actually based on real people. Um, and those people have, have never recognized themselves. Um, you know, I change enough of the details to where, you know, I'm not out to expose anyone, first of all, right? It's, I'm, I'm really creating fiction. So I'm fictionalizing real people. And, you know, it's my goal also that I capture their essence, but I don't want them to be recognizable to themselves. And so it, it has yet to happen. Um, but I will tell you, there are a lot of people who think they're in my books who have come up to me claiming to be the inspiration for Astrid, for example. That's the, the by far the most popular. There have been a lot of people claiming to be Astrid. Um, <laughs> and why not, right? And um, but she's and, Gemma Chan. Exactly, but she's Gemma Chan. Um, in this new book, I actually featured a real person, um, you know, a real living, breathing person um, in the form of Cornelia Guest. Yeah. You know? Um, and that was a fun, that was yet another fun kind of experiment I wanted to do. Like, what would happen if I took a real person and put her in a novel, you know? Um, and so far, it's worked out okay, and she is happy with her portrayal. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have another question. The food writing in your novels is so rich and delicious. Will you share what your favorite meal is? And that's from Molly. Hmm. Do I only have to pick one? Um, I would say, you know, I'm a noodle boy. So I, I love noodles of all sorts. Um, I especially like a very classic um, Singapore style fried noodle, you know, a thick noodle with lots of nice brown garlicky gravy. <laughs> that's, you know, that's my simple pleasure. And um, my Feeds a little slow here. Did no COVID or fame, oh, oh, let me rephrase. Did COVID or fame change or impinge on your writing routine? The classic um, question. Yeah, F fame, definitely no. COVID, yes. Um, you know, I think like most people, it's been a really challenging year and a half. And for much of last year, I really had a hard time doing anything creative. Um, you know, I was thankfully on tour for probably about four months. I was hardcore doing so many events for the hardcover release of Sex and Vanity. So sorry, there's a helicopter circling. Don't know if you can hear it, uh, but it sounds like it's right on top of my roof. Anyway, so yeah, for the first half, I really was too distracted, too anxious to really do much. Um, but something changed um, early this spring. Um, I've been really having a, a sort of creative streak. So I've actually written a movie script, completely original movie script. I've developed a couple of new TV ideas that hopefully, you know, let's see if we can get them aired somewhere. So it's, it's been a nice creative time um, in the past few months. Wow. And, and I think for me, it was um, just knowing that there was a vaccine out there and that it was slowly going to trickle down <laughs> to us. That sort of gave me hope, you know. And it, it looks as if someone has anticipated that uh, answer that you had given. So uh, the next question is, would you ever think about creating in another genre like comics or graphic novels? And kind of answered that question, but ever think about creating in another genre? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I read so many different genres, right? Personally, I, I you know, I, and I love graphic novels. Um, I grew up on Tintin and Asterix, you know, that's the OG graphic novel, right? <laughs> um, so I would love to do something in that space um, and maybe even collaborate with a, with a great artist, you know, on stuff. Um, I could definitely see that happening. Um, whether my agent will let me do it or not is a different thing. 
So, right. and, and your work, your novels are already very cinematic. And as I was saying, the saturation of the visual there is very pronounced. So that's mm -hmm. a very easy, right, translation. Yeah, totally, totally. Because I've certainly had a lot of fun writing scripts and screenplays, you know, and 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 wearing that hat and exercising that muscle. So I, don't, I, don't, I have to ask, are those on similar themes the, as to what we've seen so far from you? Um, actually, no. Um, actually, there are, you know, I think readers of my books will enjoy these projects, but they are a departure. Um, you know, I feel like there's already Crazy Rich Asians, right? And there's going to be a sequel and a third movie. So that I can leave to those people to, to do, you know, I'm, I'm trying to grow my wings, right? Spread my wings and, and conquer new territory and really explore other worlds, other themes, other characters, you know? Okay, hey, we have another question for you, which is, did I spy a few cameos from your previous trilogy in this new book? Is there an impending Kevin Kwan cinematic universe? Hmm. <laughs> well, you know, there are, there's at least four Easter eggs at least four, I'll say, um, in Sex and Vanity. So, you know, whoever spots it first gets a free book. But I think, <laughs> but I think everyone's getting a free everybody book. Everybody gets a free book. <laughs> you get a free book, and you get a free book, and you get a free book. With a free book, Connor yeah. mentioned, just ask for the free book and you shall be delivered. And for those of you exactly. who are just joining us, he said free books, compliments of the Wisconsin Book Festival. I did see it, Astrid there. So I earned my free book by the You Astrid. sure did, yeah. But there's uh, three more. Three more, okay. At least, yeah. Okay, another question. How easy or difficult was it for you to write this book compared to the others? You know, this was actually a tremendously easy book to, read, to write. And I actually wrote it in four months, um, which was much faster than I thought I would. It just really came flowing out. And I think partly it's because um, this is an homage, right? So there was a structure there already that I wanted to pay tribute to. Um, I ended up really changing, a, you know, the book very, very significantly, of course, you know. Um, but it was nice to have a roadmap, first of all. Um, and number two, so many of the ideas have been gestating for maybe a decade, you know, of my traveling to Capri, collecting stories. So there was a lot of stuff that I've been saving up in my little hard drive, waiting to come out on paper. And lastly, there is no baggage at all with this book. You know, with the Crazy Rage Agents trilogy, so much of that is enmeshed with childhood memory, you know, with family, with Singapore. So I really, I had to think on so many levels um, and be careful in so many ways in a way that I didn't have to be with this book. This book could just be, you know, the wild stag that it wanted to be. Like this, the, the uh, standalone, the, yeah. what, the word I'm looking for, the not interloper, you, but the, the, what, the rogue, the one mm -hmm. who goes off from trip. Totally. But, uh, I, I've loved the way that you depicted Lucy's relationship to painting, right? In a way that paralleled the Forrester portrayal of Lucy playing the piano. It was a very nice touch. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you've certainly done your homework. <laughs> so. well, I, you know, yeah. and I realized, because I love that novel and I hadn't read it for yeah. so long, I started rereading it. I always tell people, you know, if you haven't read it, it's such an amazing book. Please yeah. read, the, please read the novel and then watch the film and then read my book. And then you'll see That's right. that really my book is a dialogue between the book and the film, you know, um, and, and it's a fun little dialogue, so, I think. So you're not gonna hint for the next master that it, there's an homage no. coming up. You're not gonna give us a little. I think I'd rather just surprise you okay. when the okay. time is right. Because I, I don't want to, I don't want to promise something and then disappoint. I forgot to say Edith Wharton, and that was the, the third in the class trilogy. Uh, final question. She's amazing. Before we uh, go, 
Final question from our audience. I watched the American Master Show on AB Tan, and I loved seeing you on that show and talking about her impact on you. Uh, who are some of your favorite authors and what are your favorite books to read? Obviously, Ian Forster had an impact on you. So, right, we were, oh, that person was thinking exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, certainly Amy, Amy Tan is, Amy Tan is one of my favorite authors. You know, she was such um, a seminal influence to me very, very early on. You know, when I first read The Joy Luck Club, it was a revelation. And it was such a really tremendous honor to be able to, to say that and pay tribute to her in that beautiful documentary. Um, so she would definitely want to be one. Um, Joan Didion has been a huge influence on me. Um, you know, and, and most people don't really see the connection <laughs> between my work um, and her work, but, and there might not be none, be one, but she really has affected me as a writer, um, you know, and in what she's done, especially in the nonfiction journalistic phase. You know, I, I first trained as a journalist, you know, so my dream was, you know, sort of long form journalistic essays. And, and then I read her fiction, which was astonishingly brilliant, you know, so she was definitely another huge influence. Um, as is her, strangely enough, her brother-in-law, Dominic Dunn, you know, who was a great, much missed satirist, um, you know, who wrote amazing books like People Like Us and The Two Mrs. Grenvilles and An Inconvenient Woman. You know, he also took these almost mythical stories and, and, and sort of made them his own. Well, Kevin, it's been such a pleasure to talk to someone who has such a self-consciousness about his own art and his own practice and is also a lover of literature. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm gonna kick it back now to Connor who wants to say a few words and, and he will also reiterate the free books message that we began with, compliments of the uh, Wisconsin Book Festival. So Connor, are you gonna jump back on? Yes, I am. Just have to click a bunch of buttons. Kevin, Leslie, thank you so much. What a lovely conversation. I laughed so many times I had to check and make sure that my microphone was turned off because I didn't want <laughs> to create a laugh track for everybody. Um, it was such a thoughtful, thoughtful questions from you, Leslie. Thank you to everyone at home who asked a question. And Kevin, thank you for all of your answers and thank you for this book. I think um, in addition to your, your four books, we have some other reading that we also need to do this uh, summer, but we can get that kickstarted. As Leslie mentioned, the Wisconsin Book Festival is providing anyone who would like one with a free copy of Sex and Vanity tonight. Um, simply click the green button on your screen um, and enter your mailing information. I also just wanted to mention, um, this is the final event of our spring schedule. So Kevin, thank you for culminating what has been 27 events over four months. Um, we had uh, 7,250 people come to those events this spring. And that brings our total of virtual events up above 17,000 people since the beginning of the pandemic. And so oh. I just want to say for me and for everyone at Madison Public Library, thank you for that support. Um, thank you for supporting these authors and the hard work that they put in well before the pandemic because a book doesn't come out uh, quite that quickly. Um, and we are just so delighted to be able to bring free cultural events to Madison and to people across the world and across the country. Um, Kevin, again, one last time, thank you so much for being here tonight. And um, that's all, everyone. Uh, we'll see you again in September. Truly really a pleasure. Thank you, everyone.